Welcome to House of David Ministries. I'm Pastor Eric. And I'm Gabriella. Join us as we learn about the rich heritage of our Christian faith. In each episode, we explore a unique topic that will deepen your knowledge of Christ and who we are as His people. Hello, and welcome to another House of David podcast. For those of you who are new to House of David, we are a teaching ministry that helps Christians understand their biblical heritage and connection to Israel. My name is Gabriella, and I'm here again today with Pastor Eric. Eric, this is such a difficult and painful time that we are living in. So painful for all the people living in Israel, for all the Jewish people worldwide, and also for the many Christians around the world who love Israel and the Jewish people. And of course, for you and me personally, with all of our family and friends who are in Israel, we are both so heartbroken about the horrific terrorist attack that happened on October 7th. Yeah, it has been absolutely heartbreaking to watch the news and read the stories about so many innocent people who were just simply slaughtered by Hamas, especially the young children. I mean, it's just been heart-wrenching. And unfortunately, things are escalating now on Israel's northern front with Hezbollah and Syria and Iran are both starting to join in. And of course, south in Yemen, Yemen has been launching missiles at Israel from the south. And of course, around the world, we've seen massive demonstrations supporting Hamas and condemning Israel for defending itself against terrorism. And the rise in anti-Semitism has been off the charts, 380 percent increase in anti-Semitic attacks and outbreaks in the United States alone. You know, so I'm watching the news, seeing all these thousands of people demonstrating around the world and and chanting in support of Hamas. And I'm reminded of this verse from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? But you know, this horrific event has also united the Jewish people in Israel and All over the world, secular and Orthodox Jews are praying together. I've lost track of how many of the tzitzit have been made here in the U.S. and sent to Israel. All the soldiers, all the men want to wear the tzitzit. And, you know, this unity has given the Jewish people a renewed strength and resolve to stand against evil. And many are even returning to Israel. Yes, it has been amazing to see the thousands of young Israelis who are returning in droves to Israel to join their army units. I've seen photos of El Al flights that are so packed that people are even sitting on the floor of the plane just to get back to Israel as quickly as possible. Yeah, you know, but I see these things as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And that's what we're going to talk about in this podcast. The Jewish people are returning to the land that God promised to Abraham, and they are starting to turn back to the Lord in this difficult time for the strength to fight their enemies. So, you know, we know from biblical prophecy that in the end, all the nations are going to turn against Israel. And ultimately, eventually, Israel is going to stand alone in this world. And that is when Jesus will return. And the Jewish people will then realize that only God can save them. They're going to see him coming in the clouds with power and glory. But we're not there yet. Yes, in spite of all the hateful anti-Israel demonstrations, so many Christians are showing solidarity with Israel And they are asking how they can pray for and support the Jewish people. That is a great question. And I've had people asking me the same question. And the Lord brought two scripture verses to mind, Isaiah 40 and 44. So why don't you read two of those for us? Okay, I'm going to start with Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 2. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, as I'm pondering these verses about comforting God's people, I just want to ask our listeners that if you have any Jewish friends, neighbors, or colleagues, please reach out to them, even just a quick text message, and let them know that you are thinking about them and praying for them and for Israel. I've had so many people reach out to me in the past few weeks, even people I haven't had contact with in years. And it is so comforting and uplifting to hear that people are thinking about us and praying for us. So the other verse I'm going to read is Isaiah 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. 
I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So yeah, comforting God's people in this time of heartbreaking tragedy and incredibly difficult times and praying that they would return to the Lord, ultimately their salvation in Jesus, Yeshua. These are very powerful scripture verses that were written by the prophet Isaiah, either right before or during Israel's exile to Babylon. But they speak of immeasurable hope in the midst of incredible destruction. So tell us more about Israel's judgments especially how God used other nations to bring Israel back to himself. Yeah, sure. We know from the Bible that throughout Israel's entire history, God has always desired to have a close and intimate relationship with the Jewish people. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord declares, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. You know, God redeemed Israel from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He brought us into the land that he promised to Abraham. He provided us with his covenants, commandments, and statutes, and he raised us into a powerful and mighty nation, and he promised his immeasurable blessings if we remained faithful to him. But you know, God also warned Israel that if we turned away from him, that he would discipline us. And discipline, to me, is a better word to use than judgment, because it implies redemption, not annihilation or complete destruction. God promises in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that he would never make a complete end of Israel. And God will always have a remnant of his people. So we see frequently throughout the Old Testament how God used surrounding enemies to bring judgment against Israel. And then when Israel would cry out to the Lord, he would deliver us. It's a pattern, again, we see over and over again in the Bible. And I believe even to this day, God is allowing the same pattern. Nothing has changed. God is still disciplining Israel and he's drawing them back to himself. Going forward uh, to the time of Jesus, Jesus stood over Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem, and he said, If you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. That's in Luke 19, 42. And you know, Jesus often quoted the prophet Daniel. Daniel wrote about the coming Messiah that would be killed, how the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed, and until the end of the age, the desolations would continue to plague the Jewish people. In Daniel 9.26, he said, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall come with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, none of this is meant to condemn or cast our own judgment in any way on Israel or the Jewish people. It's just a biblical fact. God forewarned Israel in the books of Moses and in all the prophets what would happen if we turned away from him. But you know, the Lord also said how he would bring us back to himself. And we have already seen that, and much of the church has taken notice of two significant biblical prophecies fulfilled concerning Israel's restoration, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in 1948 and the recapturing of Jerusalem in 1967. But there are more prophetic events that are yet to be fulfilled. We can really see Bible prophecy playing out before our very eyes in these days that we are living in. Yes, we are. And this picture needs to be expanded so that we understand more of the fullness of what God is doing. So we talked about God bringing Israel's enemies against her to judge her or to discipline her. So now I want to focus on Israel as God's agent or instrument of his judgment against her enemies. So, Gabby, go ahead and read Isaiah 41, verse, verses 14 through 16 for us. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them. The wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Yeah, now notice that God is not talking about a time in the past. The Lord has promised to make Israel into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. And he's promised that Israel will thresh mountains, which is suggesting kingdoms, and make hills as in nations like chafe, meaning like dust. 
So God is still the commander of his army, and in the natural, Israel is that army. So when the Lord brought Israel into the land of Canaan, or Canaan, he waited until the sin of the Amorites had reached its fullness. And then he used Israel as an instrument of judgment to drive out the inhabitants of the land as punishment for their sins. Now, I've got some quotes here from several notable Christian scholars about Israel as God's instrument or agent of judgment. And so J.P.U. Lilly writes, We read in Genesis 15, verse 16, that a return from Egypt would be deferred until the sin of the Amorites had reached its full measure. In Leviticus 18, verses 24 and 25, and 20, verse 22, it says, The land is said to have been defiled so that it vomited out its inhabitants, and God punished it for its sin. And so therefore, in Deuteronomy 9, verse 4, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. In both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the Israelites are warned not to congratulate themselves on their own virtue, but to fear lest they come under the same judgment, meaning that the land would vomit them out also. And so we are reminded that Israel's land does not belong to them. God says repeatedly in the Bible that the whole of creation belongs to him, including the land of Israel, and he can give it to whomever he chooses. Okay, next quote, W.L. Alexander, commenting on God's judgments of the Amorites. He says, If Israel had no divine command to this effect, no one would pretend to justify this part of their policy. If they had, it needed no justification. When a nation has given way to such nameless and shameless wickedness that its land groans beneath the burdens of its crimes, it is a mercy to the world when the evil is stamped out. No nation has any absolute right to itself or its land. It holds its existence subject to God's will and to that will alone, and if it is good for the world that it should give place to others, he, meaning God, will cause it to pass away. And lastly, we have another author here, Craigie, and he says that there are two reasons for the total destruction of the Amorites, only one of which is stated in this context. He says that the unstated reason is that the Israelites were instruments of God's judgment. The conquest was not only the means by which God granted his people the promised land, but was also the means by which he executed his judgment on the Canaanites for their sinfulness. The second reason which is stated, if the Canaanites survived, their unholy religion could turn Israel aside from serving the Lord. So God uses Israel's enemies to bring the Jewish people back to himself. But God also uses Israel to bring his righteous judgments to her enemies. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans 11 verse 32. God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Yeah, exactly. Israel's enemies are bringing the Jewish people back to God. And Israel, as the armies of the Lord, will bring God's judgment to Israel's surrounding nations, their enemies. And I pray, humble them and bring them to salvation. Now, we're going to come back to this a bit later in this podcast, and we'll see how God's judgments have a redemptive purpose for Israel and her surrounding Arab nations, specifically the ones that are coming into this conflict today. So, Gabby, why don't you read for us Exodus chapter 12, verse 51, and then 1 Samuel seventeen forty-five, and lastly, Joshua 5, verse 14. We're going to see in these next three verses a continuation of Israel as God's armies. From the Exodus to Joshua's conquest of the land of Canaan or Canaan, and to Israel's fighting of the Philistines during the time of King David. But I believe these verses are actually still applicable to this day, including Israel's current war against Hamas. Okay, so the first verse I'm going to read is Exodus 12, verse 51. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. The next verse is Joshua 5, verse 14. So he said to Joshua, As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And then the last verse is 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Then David said to Goliath the Philistine, 
You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Yeah, these verses reveal something that is extremely important for us to know, and that is that Israel is not just God's chosen and covenant nation. She's also his physical presence in this world. And that presence, while it included the priesthood and the throne of of King David, that physical manifestation of God is also his army in this created world. And of course, who is the commander of the army of the Lord? Well, I believe it is Jesus himself, Yeshua, that is the commander of the Lord's army. Of course, we know that he's coming back in Revelation in the clouds with power and glory. So when God delivered Israel from Egypt, he judged the Egyptian people, but more significantly, he judged the gods of Egypt. So listen to what the Lord says in Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So again, it's a judgment against man and beast. It's in the natural. And the gods of Egypt, that is the judgment against the spiritual realm. We're going to further unpack that here in a moment. So you might be wondering how this biblical truth fits with what Paul said in Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, chapter 12, he says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, a lot of Christians have taken this verse to mean that we don't confront issues in the natural. We only focus on the spiritual realm in prayer, wrestling in the spirit, which is the place where the real underlying conflict is occurring. That is all true to a point. But we cannot forget that what happens in the spiritual realm also manifests itself in the natural realm. They are connected. So what Paul is really telling us is that we cannot win our battles in the natural realm alone without first engaging the spiritual. And if we only engage engage in the natural, we will use carnal tools that cannot defeat spiritual beings that have enormous power and authority. Notice that Joshua went behind the commander of the army of the Lord, not in front of him. God always goes before us and defeats our enemies in the spiritual realm so that we might come behind him and defeat them in the natural. Now, this raises an interesting paradox for Christians. Didn't Jesus command us to love and bless our enemies? Yes, he did. And I completely agree that responding to hatred and violence with more hatred and violence will help bring no one into God's kingdom. But Jesus never precludes his righteous judgments, or more accurately, his righteous discipline. And we know there is a final wrath and indignation that will come when Jesus returns. But until that time, God continues to balance his redemptive judgments with his grace and mercy. Now, we're going to develop that point again here towards the end of this podcast. But for the moment, let's dive into the spiritual realm and see how it connects with the natural. There are fallen angels, what I like to call lowercase Elohim, their divine beings, who for now have spiritual authority over the nations of the earth. And these Elohim deceive the peoples of the lands they rule over. But God's gift of salvation is not available to these fallen angels, only to fallen men. Jude said in chapter 1 verse 6, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And that's another whole uh, episode, you know, talking about the fallen angels and how Adam uh, usurped his dominion over the earth. We're not going to talk about that today, just so that we understand that there are fallen angels. And as Paul said in Ephesians, that these are principalities that have ruling authority over the earth. So what happens when fallen men worship fallen angels and refuse to repent and continue to serve these demons? Well, unfortunately, they will act with all the cruelty and barbarism that comes straight from the pits of hell, and God will judge them all together, the men and the gods that they worship. So, Gabby, go ahead and read Revelation 14, 9 through 11 for us. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God 
which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That is a powerful warning that we are not to worship anyone or anything other than the one true God of the universe who created all things in heaven and on earth. So what we can understand from this is that there is a correlation between ruling principalities and the nations who worship these fallen angels. And there are demonic spirits behind the evil that we see playing out in the world. A fascinating example I can think of from the Bible is the Prince of Persia mentioned in the book of Daniel, uh, who wrestled with the archangel Gabriel and prevented him from coming to Daniel for three weeks until the archangel Michael came to help Gabriel. That same prince of Persia spirit is coming against Israel again today. But let's talk about how all of this fits with the church and how we can connect these ancient biblical principles with what is happening today in Israel. Well, great question. And again, we've talked about Israel as God's army and how Israel rejected God's covenant and was judged for doing so. And Jesus and then later Paul tell us in the Bible that the blessings that were promised to Israel for a season, which is called the time or the fullness of the Gentiles, have been granted to the church, which today is comprised of mainly Gentile Christians. But we are also told that God's callings for Israel are irrevocable, and that Israel one day would return to the Lord and again become God's army in the natural realm. But there's a temporary distinction between the church, which is spiritual, and natural Israel. We, the church, have an important role to play for the Lord in this present time, wrestling against demonic spirits, delivering people from demonic oppression, sharing the good news of the gospel, and then later in our raptured or resurrected bodies, when Jesus returns and we return with him, it says, the armies in heaven, notice the distinction, in heaven, not on the earth, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow Jesus on white horses. And that's us. That's the church. We return with Jesus and the angels in heaven, and we are, we are his heavenly army. We will wage victorious battles in the spiritual realm against the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this age, and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But Israel remains God's army in the natural. And while he will continue to bring Israel's en- enemies against her to discipline and ultimately to bring the Jewish people back to himself, He will also use the armies of Israel to punish and destroy all who worship those demonic principalities. So God will use Israel to judge these people along with the gods that they worship, just like the time of Exodus, both man and beast, and against all the gods of the earth, he will execute judgment. That is a remarkable revelation. So help us to understand biblical prophecy and how these latest conflicts are really a continuation of one long struggle of the nations fighting against God's land and his people? That's a great question also. And to be honest, I'm not yet seeing a clear picture of biblical prophecy unfolding, at least not yet. But many of the dots are starting to connect. So there's a lot of confusion about the end times battles that surround Israel. Jesus not only said that Jerusalem would see desolations until the end, he also said there would be wars and rumors of wars. So, in other words, Israel would experience many conflicts. And we know that all of these wars will culminate in a great final battle against Israel called the War of Gog and Magog, or the Battle of Armageddon. Now, we're not there yet, but I do believe we're getting much closer. In Psalm 83, there's a very specific battle the Lord calls out, and in it, he names the people groups that come to fight against Israel. So, Gabby, why don't you read the first part of Psalm 83 for us. Sure. So this is Psalm 83, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They've taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, And let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. I I just have to interject here that it is eerie that this is exactly what Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the rest of this axis of evil are saying 
they plan to do to Israel right now. So, um, so I'm going to continue. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Yeah, these are some interesting biblical names, and scholars have studied them to find their associations with modern day Arab countries that are surrounding Israel. A few that are specifically called out are the Palestinians the Saudis, the Jordanians, Egyptians, and Lebanese, but also there are associations to Hamas and Hezbollah. But to summarize, you know, the Arabs today are not one homogeneous ethnic group. They're a mixed multitude of Semitic tribes that all share their roots with these names that are found in the Bible. We're seeing some of these groups fighting against Israel today, and again, in this conflict, that very easily could expand to include all the nations mentioned in Psalm 83, we're seeing these dots connect. And of course, Iran is very, very much in the background forming this confederacy. We see them connected to Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Houthis in Yemen. The confederacy is definitely forming. But there's another interesting detail that I need to call out, and that has to do with how these people groups were originally named. Because there's a correlation between the people groups and the gods that they worship. Now, the word Palestine derives from Philistia, which was the name given by Greek writers to the land of the Philistines, who in the 12th century BC occupied a small strip of land along the southern coast of Israel between modern day Tel Aviv, Jaffa, and Gaza. In the early 2nd century AD, the term Syria Palestina, literally Palestinian Syria, was given to the Roman province of Judea around the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt around 135 AD. That's another story. From the Bible, we know the Philistines were one of Israel's arched enemies, but they were ultimately conquered and absorbed into the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and they disappeared as a distinct ethnic group by the late 5th century. The Neo-Babylonian Empire, or the Second Babylonian Empire, was historically known as the Chaldean Empire, and was the last empire that ruled over Mesopotamia, which is today modern-day Iraq, parts of Iran, and Syria. Now, the prophet Isaiah lived in the time of the Chaldeans, but his prophecies were for a time of the future, the period of the Neo-Babylonian or the Chaldean dynasty. Isaiah prophesied that Babylon, he called it the golden city, would fall and cease to exist. This is Isaiah Uh, 14 verse 4. And Jeremiah also spoke about this in chapter 51 verses 7 through 10. So while Isaiah accurately prophesied that ancient Babylon would cease to exist, it will not be fully destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah until the end of time. So Isaiah 13 verse 19 says, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So again, this is a prophecy for the end times. In Revelation 18, we read how Babylon the Great will fall and become a dwelling place of demons. So again, the Philistines were absorbed into the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which was called the Chaldean Empire. But who were the Chaldeans and where did they come from? Well, they came historically from ancient Assyria, the same people who destroyed the northern tribes of Israel. And so here's the irony. The Romans renamed Israel to Syria, Palestinia. In other words, they changed the name of God's land to two of Israel's greatest enemies, the Philistines and the Assyrians. And these two empires ultimately become part of the Babylonian Empire that destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, Israel's third greatest enemy. So the ancient Babylonian kingdom today is a mixed multitude of people. In other words, Mesopotamia or modern-day Iraq and Iran and Syria And that whole region is a mixed melting pot of nations, and many of whom are mentioned in Psalm 83. And these people today are being deceived and driven to commit evil by many ancient spirits, all of whom have joined in a coalition against the God of Israel and the Jewish people. And it was the Chaldeans, or the spirit of Chaldea, whom Isaiah and Jeremiah specifically called out, saying in Jeremiah 50, verse 35, for example, A sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon, 
and against her princes and her wise men. So there's this complex history of gods and their associated cities. For example, the name Assyria means the country of the city of the god Assur or Ashur. And Ashur was an East Semitic god at the head of the Assyrian pantheon that stretched across Mesopotamia, which again is modern day Iraq and parts of Iran and Syria. And this god was later regarded as the Assyrian equivalent of Enlil, the god of wind, air, earth, storms, and the ruler of the cosmos. So, named after its ruling principality, the city of Ashur, which is in Syria, was the spiritual center of the Neo Assyrian Empire. So, in other words, Gods and cities are connected. They are the ruling principalities. And the people who live in these cities, named after these gods, worship these fallen angels. So we see a pattern of judgment and redemption in Isaiah and Jeremiah of God's dealing with the Jewish people. We know that Israel was idolatrous and rebellious against God. And in response, the Lord sent his prophets to warn of his impending judgments. Israel refused to repent, thus the Lord brought forth his discipline, beginning with drought and other tribulations, culminating in Israel's invasion by a foreign kingdom. The Lord, in response, promised to destroy that nation that came against his heritage, Israel. He calls the apple of his eye. In Revelation, we learn of the final ruling principality who will govern all the nations, and this Elohim is called the spirit of Babylon. So therefore, Jeremiah and Isaiah both reference this kingdom and God's ultimate victory over it, and the God who rules it. This spirit of Babylon brings about the final coalition of ruling principalities from every nation, and the people who worship these principalities will come against Israel in the final battle of Gog and Magog, or the Battle of Armageddon. So Israel is caught in the middle of the spiritual web of demons that are at war with the one true God of creation, And the Palestinian people, along with the Syrians, Persians, Russians, Chinese, and many others, are being used to fight these demonic battles in the natural. Now, I'm hearing people say we need to distinguish between the Palestinian people and Hamas. Well, in response, I say that we as Christians need to distinguish between all people and the wicked spirits that deceive and rule over them. Today, we have the spirit of Hamas, which means violence. And we have the spirit of Hezbollah in the north and the spirit of the prince of Persia, Iran, in the east. And looming in the background, the spirit of Gog, Magog, and Rosh, the prince of Russia, many uh, whom have vowed for the complete destruction of Israel and the annihilation of the Jewish people, namely Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. But in the midst of all these end-time wars and rumors of wars, there is hope of God's salvation. So, Gabby, let's finish reading Psalm 83. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endol, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Orev and like Ze'ev, yes, all their princes like Zeva and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. O oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chafe before the wind, as the fire burns the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. This psalm is filled with actually hope and redemption for all these Arab peoples who are fighting the demonic battles against Israel. Just as it says, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. I mean, that is just powerful and amazing to me that God's judgments are always redemptive. And even here, while Israel's worst enemies are uniting and conspiring against them, God is promising to humble them with his army, Israel, so that Israel and her enemies might know him. Just like Isaiah said in Isaiah 26, verse 9, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. God wants to save all people if they are willing. But if they reject his salvation, which is only found in Jesus, they will perish with the fallen Elohim, who they continue to arrogantly worship. That is a powerful revelation about God's love for Israel 
and for all of his creation. God so loves the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, Yeshua, to deliver us from every ruling spirit and principality and bring us into his marvelous light and eternal kingdom. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for this very insightful and powerful discussion. We ask that you all continue to pray for God's hand of protection over Israel and for his people Israel to find comfort and true peace in the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach. We look forward to you joining us next time on House of David Podcast. If you have enjoyed this podcast from House of David Ministries, make sure you subscribe to our channel and don't forget to visit our website where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. We pray the Lord richly bless you and we look forward to having you join us again for our next episode.